So I hope everybody had a good day today. And it's my great pleasure to introduce two leaders from the food movement. Uh, the first is Mark Bittman, who has written more than 20 books. Two of my favorites are How to Cook Everything Fast and VB6, which sounds like a Star Wars character, but it's actually a cookbook. Mark was the first food-focused op-ed columnist in the United States. His column, titled How to Feed the World, from October 14th of 2013, will help you win any dinner table argument about how we create a better food system. So everybody should read that. Mark's website says his goal is to make food in all its aspects understandable. So we can decide whether or not he's able to do that after tonight's talk. Uh, Mark is a great friend and a terrific cook, although, no, although the night I had dinner at his house, the smoke alarm went off five times. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, Mark is joined by Ricardo Salvador. M Ricardo is a senior scientist and the director of the Food and Environment Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. He was an associate professor of agronomy at Iowa State University. He's a tireless warrior for a more equitable and more just food system. And I want to share that Ricardo's a marathoner, so he has the endurance that we really need to win this battle. So as many of you know, Mark and Ricardo, along with a couple of other colleagues, were part of a group of leaders that called for a national food policy in the year 2014. And they proposed radical things like all Americans having access to healthful food, Food policies should support public and environmental health. There should be fair wages and other things. And then in 2017, they followed up with an equally important column in Civil Eats. It was called Food and More, Expanding the Movement for the Trump Era. And the column called for we, so all of us who are part of the food movement, to join forces with other progressive groups in a more immediate cause protecting the disadvantaged, and defending democracy. And a lot of the conversations I've heard today are about intersectionality, who can we work with, how do we work well with each other. So I think it's very fitting that we have the two of you here tonight to talk about how your thinking's evolved in this last year and kind of where we go from here. So welcome, and, and thanks for being here. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jill, and thank all of you for being here. I want you to remember uh, Jill's last words, which were, let's see where we go from here, and that's exactly how the two of us feel. We have nothing planned. We're just going to talk. But the way that I wanted to begin with was just to uh, tell you that um, it was actually 10 years ago that I first met Mark. And uh, there's actually a series of hilarious stories around that, but I just want to give you a couple of observations. Uh, I got to be to the ripe age of 50, and I was keeping a vow that I had made that I would never, ever my whole life go to New York City. And uh, I was working at that time at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and our communications vice president was just raving about this new column in the New York Times about food. And the copies of those columns kept stacking up on my desk. And she said, you have to talk to this guy. He sounds just like you. And I resisted that. And I thought, you know, I was at the Kellogg Foundation. I was really snotty. And I thought people needed to look me up. I wasn't going to go talk to any journalists. And I thought he wanted an interview. And I said, well, maybe we can Skype. So I just blew it off. Uh, but eventually, uh, she persuaded me to go. I'll be ever thankful to her that I made that trip to New York. And that trip to New York City was a nightmare. But we finally got there just in time to keep the appointment at the Times, went up the stairs, had 50-minute conversation with Mark, left New York City. That was the extent of that, that visit. But I made a lifetime friend there. And there's a lot of things that I value about the uh, articulate, witty, charming individual that we're going to hear tonight. I mostly intend to be quiet and let Mark riff. But here's one of the ways in which that friendship has been very valuable to me, and that is that uh, Mark and I will have conversations possibly interesting only to us. You'll be the judge of that after a while. But one of the features of those conversations has really enriched um, my capacity to communicate very complex ideas because I steal some of Mark's articulations that come about in the following way. 
we'll have a conversation and Mark will ask a question. And I'll go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So it's 20 minutes, 40 minutes later, and Mark is very patiently listening. And when I'm done, Mark says this. Oh, what you mean is, and he says one sentence, reduces 20 or 40 minutes to one sentence, which is why the man is good at what he does. And then I go around quoting that one sentence when I talk to other people. <laughs> so it's a nice system for me. So we'll see how this is going to work tonight. Mr. Bidman. How come you're only an associate professor of agronomy? <laughs> <laughs> you really want to go in no, that no, direction? No, no, I don't. <laughs> um, I just couldn't resist. Awesome, awesome room. As usual, I think it's the third year in a row I've been here. And um, I mean, it's just so inspiring. It's great. And uh, just a shout out to the um, all the young farmers in this room, but especially the really young farmers, Barbara Damrosh, Elliot Coleman, and Fred Kirshenman. <laughs> um, we, um, we value each other, as you will see, and um, I, think, I think we have awesomely interesting conversations. Um, and I am never happier in front of a crowd than when I'm doing this with Ricardo, because I feel like we support each other in interesting ways, as I hope you'll see. And if it fails, we'll take questions. Um, <laughs> but we've done this before, and it's not a comedy routine, but it also is um, probably lighter than, well, both lighter and heavier, but certainly more spontaneous than much of the stuff that you have been doing here. Um, Jill said, I want to know how you've advanced your thinking in the last year. And I said, why do people think that my thinking advances? Um, but, but Ricardo and I started talking about that, that exact thing earlier today. Um, and uh, we started talking about national food policies, and we started talking about the depressing nature of a year ago and um, the realization we were depressed a year ago for good reason, as it turns out. We, we see that. Um, but I think one thing we wanted to talk about a little bit was, uh, was policy. Because um, if we had succeeded, and, and we put, we and our uh, friends Michael and Olivier put many, many hours into this proposal for a national food policy that, in theory at least, appeared before President Obama, or at least his people. Um, and we took it quite seriously, we worked really hard on it, we traveled for it, we met with people we didn't really care whether we met with. Um, but suppose that policy had, suppose we had enacted a national food policy in 2009 or 2000. 10 or 2011, it wouldn't be worth anything right now. Um, it would be worth a faint memory. And I think one of the things, if, if my thinking is advanced in the last year, I don't know if that's the right word, but one, one recognition is that policy um, is only worth the support of the administration that's there to support it, or you know what I'm saying. So we can push and maybe get enacted any policy that we try to, um, but as we've seen, as we see every day right now, these policies are not worth anything if they don't have the support of the current administration. Um, so this, kind of brings us to the importance of, as Jill said, intersectionality, intersectionality. As I like to say, as we used to say in SDS, everything is interrelated. Um, and the importance of, obviously, groups like the one in this room. What we need to do, uh, and you know, I would actually like you to talk about this militant conversation we were having before, because I think that comes in here, but what, what we need to do is build grassroots organizations, that's for sure. And what we need to do 
is organized among ourselves and among our neighbors, among our fellow farmers, for those of us who are farmers, among our fellow workers, et cetera. And what we need to do is establish systems that will exist regardless of who's in power um, in Washington. And that's not to say even that those systems can't be defeated, but that for the most part they will be longer lasting than policies that are enacted that are and appear to be progressive, but that may be very um, short term. So can you pick up that ball for a second? So one of the things that we were thinking about, particularly regarding you as the group that we want to have a conversation with, is that we share with you the quandary that all of you are trying to overcome obstacles to breaking into a sector which is not particularly welcoming to the types of people that you are, uh, both in terms of age, in terms of background, in terms of worldview, in terms of values. And if that assumption is true, we also are arguing for a completely uh, groundbreaking redefinition of what the human activity of agriculture is. So we, we, we're operating on the assumption that we're trying to completely break a paradigm about agriculture and that you, you share that objective. And it's in that sense that these two things that Mark has just mentioned became relevant to us. What kinds of changes can you institute at the level of policy that can be long-lasting, given the lesson that we're all learning at the moment, that things can be reversed willy-nilly? Um, what can be more long-lasting in terms of structure and in terms of permanence? Now, this is an interesting idea to explore from somebody that works in an organization where we believe that winning is establishing a new policy or shifting an existing policy. And I want to come back and talk about that. But the second thing that Mark mentioned is that it seems to us like an ingredient to be able to do what I just described, to uh, pursue, institute, and preserve lasting change, completely different structures and worldviews. That this has to include maintaining a posture, a stance among all of us uh, as citizenry and particularly those of us that have a view about how things actually need to evolve and change for the better. Because one of the lessons of the past year is that evidently just about anything can happen and there's very little organized conception of a reaction or a resistance to maintain things that are valuable to the majority of us. And it was in that context, maybe uh, now that I think about that, this, this may have been of interest just to us, but Mark was recently in a conversation where he heard the application of the word militancy uh, from somebody that does their work in Latin America. And the, the reason why I think it's important to mention this is that um, that word, when it's used by anyone uh, who's speaking in one of the Romance languages, has a completely different meaning that you might interpret if you just hear it in English. Your association tends to be obviously with the military and with, with folks that take a posture in, in terms of a militarized approach to an objective. And there is an overlap with what this uh, means if, if you work uh, any place where uh, the dominant language is a Romance language. And not to get into trivialities, but when you use this word in Spanish, in Italian, and in French, in essence, what that word means is that you are committed and active in pursuit of a goal. That if anything is known about you, people will know this is what this individual is about. That person's stance on this position is not going to change. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're out there in fatigues wearing a beret, but it means that people are really clear that you stand for something. And that's the second point that, that Mark mentioned. It seems like that's the thing that we all need to strive for and attain so that then we cannot be railroaded, you know, run roughshod over in violation of principles that go all the way from social norms to supposedly, ostensibly, legal strictures in the Constitution and in the founding values of the nation. So now I promise you I'd come back to this notion of being at an institution where we believe that, the, that winning is actually shifting a policy. There, up until this last year, there was this truism that I particularly subscribe to in terms of doing policy work, 
that I think was shared by anyone that did policy work, and that is that policy makers and government in general cannot get ahead of where popular culture is. That policy is a manifestation of what popular culture either allows or demands. So the, the textbook examples of that are, we used to be, some would argue, we still are pretty much in a very sexist society, a very race, racist society. Um, but there came a time when the critical mass of society would no longer put up with the institution of slavery, and there was a violent process whereby we exchanged views about that. That is a euphemism, but after that exchange of views, at least the force of the government stood on the side of equality, of freedom for everyone. Now, that's a different topic, but I'm using the textbook example of saying there came a time when the majority have said we will not stand for the institution of slavery. Apply the same sort of rationale to the franchise for women. It still is not even 100 years before all of us, all of us thought it was just a given that women should not vote. They, they did not have the capacity to make the decisions required to enjoy the franchise. It'll be in 20 uh, when we celebrate that threshold. And you can think of lots of examples like that where at least according to the textbook, it was the popular culture that determined then what policies could do. So even though you might have illumined progressive policymakers in office, if the culture did not support what they wanted to institute, uh, say freedom of choice, um, then they couldn't go there. And now it's not so clear that you can't institute policies that have nothing to do with what the majority of the population actually values or supports. And this is where there is a lot of public discussion, if not angst, around whether the basic foundational premises of a country like this actually stand uh, anymore. So it may be far afield of what most of us are here to talk about in terms of the future of agriculture. But for those of you of us that were here uh, this afternoon over lunch, you'll be familiar with the argument that a group of us made that the worldview of agroecology and a different conception of what we're performing when we do agriculture is actually rooted in self-determination. Completely different view of the parceled out, commoditized, monetized view that is just going to bankrupt us collectively. Right. Um, okay, we're done. I can't sum that up yeah. in one sentence. Um, to pick up on two things. Um, one is that I think if we, if we take the word militant, militante, to mean lifelong activist, then we need to be militants. That's one thing. So what do we need to be militant about? And I think if we go back to, um, conveniently, we go back to the mid to late 19th century, we see, um, we see a country in which land was distributed unequally. Um, and we see a country in which land was distributed or grabbed um, almost entirely by white men. Um, and now there are all of these issues, and, and that, that po the policies that have supported ownership of land by white men began 100, 150 years before, say, the Civil War, and have extended until now. Now we hear um, a great deal of talk about it aging farmers and what we're going to do to keep people on the land in the United States and so on and so forth. But um, to a large extent, it is a question of how to get land into the hands of people who want to work on it. And what I know everyone in this room believes is that the people who want to work on, on land ought to be people who want to grow real food. So um, we're at a turning point, and we're not only at a turning point because farmers are aging, although that's a common discussion, we're at a turning point because it's extremely important right now, and I know we all agree on this too, that people grow and eat real food. Um, but we have a system of policies, and in fact we have a global system that encourages uh, large farms that grow predominantly not real food or not food at all. Um, and the question is how to make that transition. And the answer to that question is a dirty word or a dirty two words, and those dirty two words are land reform. And um, no one 
discusses land reform because as soon as you discuss land reform, you're a communist. But actually, you're not a communist. You're a militant. You're a lifelong activist. You're someone who wants to put land into the hands of people who deserve it and will do right by it. And you know, I can speak in shorthand here because we're among friends, um, and and we really are among friends and and comrades. And everyone everyone knows what I'm talking about. But the question is. How are we going to get to a place where th this land, and of course some of the best land in the world, best farmland in the world, is held by um, descendants of white men who are largely still white men um, who were given it or took it in the 19th century? Um, how are we going to get that land, which is often parceled into properties that um, really can't be farmed other than by machine, um, and it's developed that way, how do we transition that land into the hands of um, y'all, as we say, um, and other people who want to farm it? And the answer to that question is land reform. And um, this is a conversation, and this is where, this is where, uh, lectures and talks and so on are not really a proper domain because there's no clear answer to this question. Um, I have a proposal and in the, in the current atmosphere it's a ludicrous proposal, but that doesn't mean it's a ludicrous proposal into the future. And the proposal is to recognize that the land in this country is held um, by people who largely inherited it or stole it um, or got parts of it for very, very little money. And that was on, that was at the behest of the federal, largely at the behest of the federal government, which in one sense is us. Um, it's our land. Um, yeah. Uh, so the question is how do we take some of that land back? And, um, the thing that I think that we should be struggling for, that we should be fighting for, is some kind of reformed inheritance tax or transfer tax that says if you have a bigger, if you have a piece of property that's bigger than X, and X is not arbitrary, it's sensible, and whether that's 100 acres or 500 acres or 1,000 acres, I don't know, then when that property is transferred, either because you die or you sell it, then X percent of that property, and again, maybe that's 1%, and maybe it's 5%, and maybe it's 10%, reverts to the federal government and is sold at a very reasonable cost to people who want to farm that land in a different way. Now, that sounds pretty simple to me. Getting to that place is not going to be simple. And um, outside of this room or rooms like it, it's going to sound like I was just speaking Greek. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we need to be moving towards because everything about this interrelatedness um, it is, is connected. That's what interrelatedness means. But land is the capital that we're working for. Land is the capital that is at the basis of all of this. And nothing's going to get fixed until land is in the hands of people who want to farm it for the benefit of all of us and for the land itself. Um, right. You're going to talk about Martin Luther King, aren't you? <laughs> so um, we know each other too well. So um, if, if these ideas sound ridiculous, the, the thing to remember is that um, the majority of the land that Mark was referring to, the breadbasket in the United States and, and the large proportion of the most agriculturally productive areas in the United States right now were acquired because somebody crossed the ocean who signed documents, I the king, by the doctrine of discovery, decided that land that they had never known or knew anything about could be allocated by their will and proceeded to do so by force. Uh, or 
that once this country was no longer made up of colonies and it had become independent, by military force, there was concerted genocide, displacement, and removal of peoples to come to possess land. And then redistribution occurred. So if an idea like the one that Mark describes sounds ridiculous, it's actually a very benign, progressive idea compared to how most of the land actually came to be in possession of who it is in possession now. Now, before we go forward, as Mark has said several different times, we know your friends, we know that you've thought about these ideas. Sometimes talking about these things without mincing words is difficult, and it's, I, I have learned that it is important before getting into remedies for these structural inequalities um, to, to point out that for all of us to be non-defensive and to be open-minded about these topics, we should be really clear that our forebears did what they did, and we can't do anything about what they did. But we can do something about the society that we want to be a part of and that we want to create for the future. So there's no need to be defensive about who we are, what we have right now because of what happened before us. We do need to recognize it. We do need to be aware that we're part of a real life game of serpents and ladders that describes why some of us are where we are and others are not. So that is an important part. But it's just as important to get over the defensiveness of that and talk about how we build the society that we want for the future. And the society that we have right now, it's very important to recognize, uh, particularly when the sorts of things that we're considering here and that many of us are talking about right now, which is uh, reparations, uh, redistribution. Um, when, when people talk about that as being uh, extreme, or react to those notions as being extreme ideas and uh, a manifestation of victim thinking and how we all need to actually um, be entrepreneurial and, and lift ourselves by our bootstraps like everyone else did that has wealth and that has privilege now. I am reminded of a passage that I'm, I'm going to read to you here that probably in this room many of you are familiar with from Martin Luther King. Uh, you can look this up on video to receive the real power. There's no way that any of us can replicate the man's power. Um, but he spoke these words just a few months before he was assassinated. But what he's going to be describing is what many sociologists have called the reality of how we came to have the present structure of society, which was, in essence, affirmative action for white people, which is why... I wanted to be really clear with that prefatory comment. Let's not be defensive about that. Just recognize how we got to where we are right now and what we want to do about it from now into the future. So this was spoken by Dr. King in March 1968. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and Midwest which means they were willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. And not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, Today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. So that's the kind of pragmatic reality and understanding of history upon which we need to found a sober reassessment of what we need to undo in order to really live the premises that the majority of us believe describe the kind of country and society that we want to be a part of. Just quoting somebody else's eloquence and clear view of the situation. I, no, I don't know what to, I don't even know what this, it just seems so, um, to return to the militant theme, you know, when, uh, un, until this conversation about, about militants um, came up, when someone said, oh yeah, we're militant, I thought of Che Guevara. But the, pers the people to think of when you say we're militant are Gandhi and King, um, and 
a host of others, maybe even including us. Um, <laughs> Rosa Parks. Um, but the other thing that you said, and you, you kind of glossed over it, is there is this country that we say we want to live in and that we say, and this is not just this room, this is the rhetoric of the United States, is that we're a country of equality and that we're a country of freedom and that we're a country of fairness. And that is the country that we supposedly want to live in by the letter of the law. So really the question is how we build that country and we build it um, either with the help of government or in spite of government, but it's up to us to build it. You know, I really don't know where to go from there. So, um, can we take questions? <laughs> Hi, my name's Adrian. One question I have is we're working in a paradigm of extractive capitalism. And not only do we have to unwind that in our own country, but it's kind of an idea that we have manifested in some of the biggest countries in the world, whether it's India, whether it's China, whether it's Latin America. And so a lot of our conversation has been, how do we solve this in our own country? I'm curious if you have any ideas on how do we solve this at a global level when um, this idea of extractive capitalism has really expanded globally? Um, well, we don't. Um, you know, one of the rules of organizing is um, you uh, don't organize what you think are the, you don't organize people according to the principles you think, you order that, organize them according to their principles. Um, you don't organize, you don't try to solve the problems you imagine there are. You try to solve, help them solve the problems that they say there are. So um, I think it's likely that these problems are solved in the countries you mentioned before they're solved here. And I think it's likely that, um, you know, there's this term bouncing around right now, leapfrogging. And um, if you're not familiar with it, the most, the clearest manifestation of it is um, in Africa, there are very few landline telephones because no one needs landline telephones because they're expensive to build and it's easy enough to have a cell phone. It's quite possible that agroecological principles, that um, land reform, that good nutritional practices and food that's um, fit to feed people in general happen in many other countries before it happens here and that we're not the global leader anymore. We're the global laggard. Um, that's not assuredly the way it's going to happen. It could happen otherwise. But I don't think these kinds of issues are going to be resolved in the United States first or, or last necessarily. But I, I certainly don't think we're going to lead the world by example. I think it's quite possible that, I think it's quite possible that India leads the world by example for example, um, or Mexico does. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So I want to add something to that. I, my first reaction, Adrian, when you started posing your question was you went there because you talked about the paradigm of the extractive economy and capitalist thinking. And there's a way to get into this, this topic which immediately is adversarial, you know, the partisans of capitalism and those that are critics of capitalism. And I think that there's a more constructive way of thinking about this by realizing what gave rise to what today we, we clearly recognize as a particular worldview in, in capitalist thinking and what types of problems people were trying to solve about the time. But they, they had to do with what today we call globalization, the, the increasing complexity of a mercantile system that did wrap around the planet and it was so complex that it was difficult to make decisions about what would be best and for whom. And that interplayed with power dynamics, you know, who was going to colonize and own land and where the wealth was going to be redistributed and so on. And the analysis that led to actually 
quantifying, naming, coming up with the equations, I don't mean just in the mathematical sense, but the rationalization for how you made those sorts of decisions, led to simplifications that today we call capitalism. If we can sympathize with the fact that that's what we were collectively trying to do and that was a, there was a particular part of the world that led in that sort of thinking because they were the violent colonizers that were aggressively having to solve those sorts of problems for themselves, they have done a great deal of damage to humanity because that simplification led to believing that you could understand the world as a mechanism, that you could simplify it to specific gears and certain knobs that you would turn, and it devalued things that you couldn't easily recognize and quantify and relate to one another. And the key problems that we're having to contend with right now that we call global warming, for instance, those are things that we completely overlooked that we thought had nothing to do with the things that we valued and therefore specifically manipulated and made critical decisions about. So if instead of dividing into camps around whether we're critics or proponents of that idea, we say, as humanity, that was a first stage in terms of trying to be global citizens. As humanity, we need to advance to a different stage with a completely different understanding of what the key things are that need to be interrelated and who needs to be engaged in answering those questions. Let's come up with a different way in which we understand we are one species with one capsule, one shot at being able to make it for the long term and come up with the new worldview that allows us to solve those problems in that conception. You want to? I keep waiting for you to come. <laughs> No, we'll take another question. Hi, I'm Corinne. And, you know, I was listening to you and was hearing a lot of, like, Alinsky and Freire in your community organizing backdrop and being trained as a farmer in rural Maine and then as a social worker in Pittsburgh, the sort of detach and... Um, you know, this type of sort of like anarchist, like uh, disconnection, backwoods, farming life, and then, you know, community engagement and sort of engage with policymakers. And I, you know, I've sort of wondered how do I merge these two things um, in my life and thinking about like what types of community organizations are a good forum for engagement on food when I think you know, you've mentioned that we're in a room of friends and I think, you know, living in a place that has only a newly burgeoning sense of food community as Pittsburgh does, um, I find it hard to get people engaged. Um, you know, I say the word organic local food or the phrase and people really recoil like that's too, that's too far away from our paradigm to really get there. Um, and so it's just it's interesting to me just as someone who sort of has a foot in each world, like how to negotiate that. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts. Well, so my first reaction is that you should answer this, but I wanna. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my first reaction is the best organizing tool for farmers in, in communities that are not what do we say, food aware, I don't know what the term might be, is RCSAs. Um, but maybe that's too obvious, or maybe that's um, not aggressive enough. But, you know, I do think that taking good food that's from real farmers and real farms and saying to your neighbors, here's really awesome food um, that's affordable and um, from nearby, is gonna lead to a conversation about that food, and that's what organizing is, but maybe that's too simplistic. So I would, I, I can't resist mentioning this because it was the first thing that you mentioned. So uh, so he's Alinsky, I'm Freire, and I've never been so flattered. So, uh, but, uh, so therefore, you know, speaking along a fair in line, um, I, I agree with what Mark has just said, and, and this is how I conceptualize it. I want to give you an example that comes from the United States. There's many of examples from outside of the United States. Um, uh, all of, every single one of you in this room are familiar with the Coalition of the Immokalee Workers. The example that I want to draw from is how they came up with what uh, is now called the Fair Food Program. 
Uh, the issue that they were dealing with was the exploitation, and as many of you know, actual enslavement, not metaphorical or figurative enslavement, actually binding people in chains so that they would come back to work the next day in central and southern Florida for the tomato harvest. A critical issue that they were dealing with was that there were very concrete ways in which this manifested in their work. It manifested in the fact that they were not being given fair wages for their work and the fact that they were being uh, exploited because there was wage theft even when supposedly they were being paid for work that they had been done. Uh, for women working in the field, they were continuously subjected to harassment and sexual violence. Uh, there was lack of certainty that they could be employed from one season to another, and so on. Serious fundamental problems that the majority of outside observers might have said, this group of disempowered, disenfranchised, marginalized, poor, farm workers are never going to be able to solve this kind of exploitation. And a matter of a few years, they were able to come up with a dramatically successful model for how to overcome that and make things better for themselves, not by going to specialists or academics, um, and maybe the majority of them not even having ever heard the name of Freire, but doing something very fair in, which is that they basically began to have conversations among themselves where they articulated what was wrong with the system that they were a part of and what would make it better, and then starting working toward that and asking really sharp questions about what was reinforcing the system that was victimizing them and how they could counter that. And it's a very interesting story. Actually, some of the members of CIW have been in this very room talking about that model in the past. I'll just give you one or two examples of what they came up with that made a crucial difference. So one of the things that they realized was that one of the facile reactions to who was victimizing them was to say it's the farmers, because the farmers were their first point of contact. Those were the people that were either parent paying them fair wages or not. But they soon realized that actually the farmers shared more in common with them than not. That it wasn't within the economy of the farmers that they were working with to give them better wages. That those folks were barely making it. And so they had to go further up the literal food chain to figure out where the thinness of the margins was actually coming from and then attack it at that level. So what they did was to figure out, well, this is all happening at the level of the very largest purchasers that are not looking at what it costs to provide a fair value chain. They're just decreeing from the very top what they're willing to pay and then squeezing the value chain. And then, you know, this is a, a group of just a few dozen people doing this thinking. Then they had to ask, how can we possibly threaten that system, these large, powerful, global mega corporations? And as many of you know who know the story, the answer that they eventually come to was, to was to conclude the single greatest vulnerability those corporations had was their public image. If they attacked their public image and made it clear to their buyers that they were actually profiting from exploiting people, from sexual violence, from wage theft, that that would be the most harmful thing that they could do to those companies. And these were companies like Burger King, McDonald's, and so on. And that strategy worked. And it worked because they organized folks to travel up and down the East Coast to go to the headquarters of these corporations, stand in front of the restaurants, stand in front of the corporations, and to say to clients coming in for a burger and fries, do you know that when you're buying these fries, you're supporting slavery, wage theft, exploitation? None of those companies could stand that for very long. And the model that they asked for them to put in place to make it better was actually something that was relatively simple in terms of a remedy because of the scale of the system, and you know it popularly as the penny per pound program. So if as little as one more penny per pound of harvested tomato, together with an auditing system to verify that, uh, at details about how farmers could be exploited in terms of what you counted that they had harvested when they delivered it to the uh, trucks in the field, together with an auditing system to verify that everyone was being treated fairly, something as simple and as logical as that as defined and executed by farm workers out of their own lived experience and their own creativity and entrepreneurship, that solves that particular problem. So coming back to your initial question, think about it among yourselves, your peers, and ask those root questions and then say, how can we leverage the things that are victimizing, pressuring us, and causing our problems, and be creative about doing it yourself. That's the lesson that I gather from that.
Hi, this, mess, um, this question is for Mark Bittman. How do you hold yourself accountable to communities of color and vulnerable, um, vulnerable communities? You talk a lot about racism, sexism, isms, and I think that as a person of color, I'm not most afraid of the Republican. I'm most afraid of the liberal who says that they are for people of color, um, changing the ills of our past, even though um, in regard to your history, um, you might not have directly um, had a connection to maybe your wealth, for example, however you do benefit from it. I would say, like, how do you hold yourself accountable to the things that you say that you aspire to change, especially in regard to people of color, and in regard to people of color being at the table to have um, a voice in regard to the future as our population changes? And I would also say this, that um, I've tried to introduce myself twice to you in regard to a curriculum that I've created based on an article um, that you wrote. And I would love if you'd like to invite me over to your house to share that with you um, for a meal. Thanks. OK, well, fair enough. I'm not sure what the question was. I don't know what I don't know what hold yourself accountable means. I don't think I pontificate, and I swear I spent my life trying to create real change. So if I'm a failure at that, I apologize, but I've done the best I can. Great, I love to follow that. So I'm Lisa, this is the Young Farmers Conference. Thanks for having me, I don't know how I got in, but I'm still a beginner farmer, less than 10 years. And I just wanna remind everybody in this room, I do currently own my own farm, barely, and that's a whole story. For all the young farmers in here, just walk your talk. You have a lot of years of learning, you have a lot of years of life, and this is not all on you, okay? You just decide what you're passionate about. You're, we're all here, first of all. We're all privileged to be here. Let's all take a moment and realize that. And then, just do what you love to do. If it's farming, if it's policy, but choose something. We in this room are not responsible to fix all these problems. And, and a little bit I'm feeling that tonight. It's a little bit, I'm feeling a little down in the whole vibe in here. And not because of just this last interaction, but the whole, and not to dig either one of you, because I've heard both of you speak before, and you're amazing, and what you guys do is good work. But pat yourselves on the back for doing what you do, and just keep doing it. That's where I'm at in my life, and if you're passionate about it, and you love what you do, and you believe in what you do, then just do it and be glad you're here right now, and stay on the positive side. Hi, my name is Peggy Delaney, and I, have, I wear a lot of different hats. I chair the Stone Barns Board. I'm a grass-fed beef farmer in uh, Montana. I founded an organization called Synergos, which I'll mention in a little while, 30 years ago, to try to create the kinds of inclusive partnerships that could address these kinds of issues mm -hmm. in different parts of the world. So I wanted to go back a little bit to Adrian's question, um, but I should also say that I'm David Rockefeller's daughter, and I am obviously one of those privileged people who um, comes from a family that owns a lot of land and um, am doing the best I can to try to both create 
circumstances where people get to participate and therefore get to changing policy. So this may take a couple of minutes, but I'm going to state sort of, well, not everything, but a little bit of what I've learned in these 30 years working both around these kinds of issues and other issues related to equality, mostly in other parts of the world. So I'm very aware that I'm sitting at a table with a group of people from Unilever who are generous supporters of Stone Barns and who represent one of the corporations that is part of the capitalist world and at the same time who has a leader, Paul Pullman, who's really working hard on sustainability and trying to create a different atmosphere and not only atmosphere but policies and practices around the world that will shift the system. So I wanted to start by first of all agreeing that creating grassroots movements is extremely important. In fact, without that, we're not gonna get at all to where we wanna be. However, I would also say that that's not enough. I would also say that the grassroots movements need to connect with each other because unless they get strong enough to have an, a real voice, they won't get a seat at the table. And one of the ways of getting them a seat at the table is to find the allies in other sectors and other parts of society that are gonna support them. In the early days of Synergos, we used to call this the sandwich effect. So you have the grassroots, and then there's all kinds of other people who are basically standing for different things. But you also have, we, we have the view that there are allies in every sector. So you find who those allies are, and you sandwich those who are maybe in the middle or on the sides or even up above who aren't supporting those kinds of changes. I don't see another option other than revolution which has severe consequences we all know that is gonna get us there and probably at this point, given what's going on in the world, wouldn't succeed in any case. And I wanna tell you one example from China which isn't actually about farming but about a very smart guy named Ma Jun who started an organization in a very totalitarian society to try to change the way pollution, um, air, water, and ground is um, treated in China. So he made one interesting strategic choice. He didn't use the US um, embassy um, data on pollution, which is much worse than the Chinese data. He chose to choose the Chinese data because it was bad enough. So that bought him a little bit of tolerance from the Chinese government. The next thing he did was he went to the brand companies, multi, multinational companies, and he said, listen, you know, you guys are living in Beijing or Shanghai or one of the other big polluting cities. You know that this is intolerable. Can you help us with your downstream producers to put pressure on them so that they will stop polluting. And they agreed, and they started doing it. Meanwhile, the Chinese government is cheering him on, which is pretty amazing, because he's an NGO in China, which is very much scared of NGOs. And then the next thing he did was he created an app which anybody can get for free, and which identifies every single polluting site in all of China that anybody from the most rural village can tap into and report a, a pollution that's happening in their community and then take that as a, group, as a group of citizens, which they do in China, amazingly enough. And actually, the Supreme Court is training prosecutors all over, this, all over the country how to prosecute um, pollution. So this is a case study of what I view as an amazing way of thinking that is, it's like out of the box. This guy is such a genius. And so what I would like to propose to you is, you know, through Stone Barns or other organizations, you as farmers are not gonna be isolated. You have your own groups, your unions, but you also have access to other groups and other people who are trying to make change. So definitely focus on the grassroots and on what you're doing, but at the same time, keep an open mind to who else you could connect to and how as a group and an expanding group, because the more you do bend together, the more power you yourselves will have, you could find the allies in other sectors so that regardless of what the administration is, eventually those policies will change. Thank you.
Thank you. Oh, Barbara. Well, I too would like to say something encouraging. First of all, I suggest you find an essay by a guy named Jonathan Latham, and that's L-A-T-H-A-M, as opposed to Jonathan Latham, the novelist, who's also great. But it's called Why the Food Movement is Unstuck. I'm not sure whether it's actually been published in a publication, but I think you can Google it or find it on his website. But what he says, basically, is that it's a, a, for most people, it's not a movement of ideology or class or anything. It's something we all, as human beings, can relate to. But I want you, in case you're skeptical about that and discouraged, I want to give you a little example of what's happened in Maine, where I farm. There was something that arose called the local food ordinance movement, and some, what, 14, 20 towns passed resolutions that any farmer or any gardener could sell to their neighbors without any government interference. And we, we have a very red-blue kind of polarization in Maine, as I suppose a lot of states do. This was the one issue that completely united people whenever there was a meeting in town to discuss this. And our little town, which is very red-blue, was unanimous in voting it in. And so the local people were just as adamant about nobody preventing the brownie troop from selling brownies to people as we were about friends of ours selling raw milk to people. We all voted together. So I just leave you with that little glimmer of a positive outlook on this. Thank you. I just want to go back to what some may have felt was an uncomfortable moment. Um, I'm not sure who spoke. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. And um, I just want to invite all of us, including myself, to lean into the discomfort if you're feeling uncomfortable and get used to feeling uncomfortable. And. Um, I think if we're going to create revolutionary change, that it, that is where we have to begin. And um, I think that is where positivity lies also. And I think there's a lot of really great examples of folks out there doing that. Um, there's, there's white people who are organizing for racial justice, who are holding themselves accountable to people of color, listening to people of color, um, feeling the, the pain, right, um, as white people and grieving. I think we haven't adequately grieved as a country. Um, so I just want to invite that in. Mark, you do tremendous work. And, um, and it f like, felt like there was a little, you know, some, some silence or some defensiveness, and, um, which I've also felt as a white person. Um, but to just, once again, just invite the, the discomfort in. Maybe there's not a response right away, but maybe there can be more listening. Um, and from that, something will arise. Thank you. Can I come back to you? We'll take a couple more. Good evening. My name is Seek. Um, I'm a black lesbian. I do not have a question. I just want to let black people know that your dismissal was hurtful. Um, it was enraging. And I'll show you, Orlando. Um, this room is over some percentage of white. Land reform? Not the business. The Rothschilds owe Native people this land back. Um, I'm here as a product of years of um, breeding. You know, so I just want to say to the black people in the room, especially just because I can, I'm black, um, but also people of color. If y'all need me, I'm here this week. So um, please, hugs, handshakes, 
daps, whatever you need, because this shit is exhausting. Um, and we're not all friends. Y'all don't listen to us. So if you agree that the global stockholder-based business model is the root of a lot of our problems, what business model would you propose to compete against it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair question given some of the statements we've made here. Uh, th so that, that, that presupposes um, this concept of a business model. Uh, I would replace that with relationships. What different relationship do we want to hold, not only to each other, but the world that we live in? How do we value and quantify those sorts of things in a different way? Now, it would be pretentious for me to go much further than that, but the very notion of a business model exemplifies this uh, simplifying, over, overly simplifying, we'll always have to work with simplifications, but, but a destructive simplification of understanding who we are in relation to our world and to one another. So that's how I would, would change that notion. So not to leave it at the abstract level, uh, that one example that I gave you by necessity you know, had to be brief, but it, it basically was a description of how people learn to value one another differently. For instance, if it was missed in there, the farmers and the farm workers became allies in recognizing what needed to shift about the system to benefit them all ultimately. So it would be more shifting uh, qualitatively thinking about one another, the roles that we can play, what we can expect of one another, and so on. I would begin to explore those kinds of shifts. Okay, last question. Hi, um, I'm Sarah, I'm from South Carolina, and I have a small urban farm, a few plots, and talking about business models, it's hard because we're only three years in. I hope I can reach some other small, smaller plots, I suppose, in reference to land. So we're in this booming new town, Greenville's growing exponentially. We've had land thrown at us, strangely enough. We have people with money that want to grab these little plots of land before they get taken over. And they're like, hey, we'll give you this land for free. Um, grow stuff. Um, and they essentially tell us, you know, then restaurants get behind them and then fancy restaurants get behind them. Chefs get behind all of us and they say, grow this, grow this, grow this. Um, we, it's strange. I thought I was gonna have to fight for it and instead I'm doing what I'm told. And it's, I don't know if I like it. Um, the landowner expects a free CSA um, and will show up to the farmer's market and say, oh, can I get a bunch of carrots? And it almost degrades a little bit. I don't know if anybody else has this experience. Because we're so new, we're just doe-eyed and ready to be like, yes, yeah, and please. Um, but we have found ourselves in a little bit of a predicament so I'm not so sure what our next step may be to kind of grasp. We don't make enough to own and buy land yet to have our own. Um, we have a house that we bought, which is out of the urban farm. We're out of town. So we have that to do, but and that's wonderful. But it's just a little bit hard to get our name in without kind of feeling like we're having to, again, do as we're told. So. Um, just kind of curious if you have any advice as to how to get ourselves doing what we want to do. I don't. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, so I'm not going to be able to address your question directly because I actually think that the wisdom on that actually came from you know one of our colleagues in the room who spoke earlier, which was to say each one of us, my rephrasing, each one of us in our own little corner and the circumstances in which we find ourselves need to contribute to shifting the kind of world that we're in now to make it the kind of world that we want to be in. And, and I also want to mention a couple of things about the process here this evening. 
I, I like the fact that what I consider to be uh, one of the wisest things I've heard tonight actually came out of the group in reaction to the conversation here or observation of the conversation and the flow, because it does mitigate against something that I think is not helpful, you know, which is the structure of two wise people instructing everybody else when in fact we're all in the same conversation. And you remember when we started, I mentioned when we were thinking about this, we thought about the fact we're all in the same boat. We're trying to figure out how to overcome what is against what appear to be insurmountable structural barriers. And so we have that in common. And the other thing about the, the process, which I love, you know, I've been coming to uh, Stone Barns for a few years now for several different conferences. I, I think some of you, from what I understand, may also be here several times, maybe for this uh, conference or other conferences. I have to tell you, um, the, the kind of freedom, to be honest, and the kind of freedom not to mince words and talk about the real issues, that has not been the typical Stone Barns, Stone Barns conversation. Stuff is happening here. Things are changing. The quality and the honesty of the conversation is being elevated. It, it is due to all of you, but also to the hosts at Stone Barns, welcoming that. And you know the, the key ingredient, as we've seen tonight, is who's in the room and feels free to say the things that are on their mind. So I want to encourage all of you to continue doing that, of course, but also recognize that Stone Barnes is giving us the space to do that and that they're growing and learning and expanding as well, together with the rest of us. So thanks to all of you here. I just want to echo what Ricardo said, and I appreciate everyone's candor and honesty tonight in the room, and I appreciate the messages about all of us doing what we can from our corner and the message about relationships. Um, I had a great day. I got to interact with many of you, and I loved it. I loved hearing about your work, and I look forward to the next couple of days kind of coming together and talking about what you do and how our work relates to the work that you're doing at home in your own community. So thank you for being here, and uh, I look forward to talking more. <laughs>